My name is Chris, and I know I speak for the rest of Decided when I say that we are blessed by your presence this morning, and we hope that the service will be a blessing to you. Our first few songs this morning are ultimately about God's love. My song, To Be Like You, speaks about some of the characteristics of God that we should strive to live into. We should long to be the hands of God to heal. We should look for ways that giving resources of time, money, material items can make an impact. And we should use the creative power of our words to make a positive impact and lift others up. 
All of these things are done in love. Your Love Awakens Me by Phil Wickham and Indescribable by Chris Tomlin are a bit more obvious concerning the theme of love. God's indescribable love for us can break down the walls that we put up that keep us from experiencing God's love fully. John 4, verses 7 and 8 say, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God, for God is love. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning not to get something from you, but instead we come to give you glory and honor and worship. We say that where two or three are got gathered in your name, that you will be present. God, we are but a group of sinning believers gathered together here at JPC, and we number way more than two or three. So come, Father, into this place of worship as we honor you. Let our songs and words be pleasing to you. Let your love awaken us this morning as we sing and shout, as we play stringed instruments and cymbals, as we hear your word proclaimed. Let us make a joyful noise, and may you be glorified and pleased. Amen. Please stand and sing with us. There were walls between us. By the cross you came and broke them down. You broke them down. And there were chains around us. By your grace we are no
this day and we put on our best face and we do our best to come and be happy and to worship God but the truth is we all carry things with us we carry with us the fears and burdens of the day we carry with us those things we're ashamed of those sins that we we hold in our hearts maybe some of them we don't even want to let go of and we're kind of happy with them but the good news of the gospel is that Jesus died on the cross for you and for me and when we go to God in a time of confession, God hears us and God uh, washes away our sins and forgives us and lets us start new and afresh in Him. So I invite you this day to take a few moments of personal reflection, to pray and to give to God those things that you need to, to offer your, your, your shortcomings and your problems to God and to claim victory in His name. Let's go to God in a time of silent confession. Didn't 
truth of the gospel is this, that by God's grace, we are forgiven. And there's great peace in that, but there's also great joy and great celebration in that. So let's stand and share that peace with excitement with one another in the name of Jesus. The kids would like to come down and spend some time with Sammy and I. That'd be great. <clears throat> come on down. Yeah, we don't need that today. We don't need that today. But thank you, though, for offering that to Grammy Sammy. That's very helpful. You can sit here with me. Okay, sounds good. Well, it's great to see everybody today. And I know some of you have uh, brothers and sisters, and some of you do not. And some of you have older brothers and sisters, and old, you know your brothers are much older. But I want to talk to you today about something that was a problem for my brother and I every single day of our lives. And that was getting even. Getting even. Do you know what that means? What that means is when someone, in this case my younger brother, did something to me, I would feel the need to do something back to him. Rob, did you ever have that situation with your brothers? Thumbs up, right? Not, not, not that we're proud of it, right? But it was the reality of, of our, our existence. Um, you know, he would take one of my toys, so I'd take three of his toys. Or he would 
bump into me, so I'd run and catch up and push him down. And maybe it doesn't have to be our brothers and sisters. Maybe it could be uh, people at school that frustrate us or whatever, right? And I remember one time specifically, and we were way too old to be, be <laughs> telling you the age, but we were playing hockey on, on rollerblades, like skates that you can ride on the road outside. And we had our hockey sticks, and he bumped me, and I chased after him, and he didn't even have the ball, and I chased after him, and I hit him, and we both fell into a fire hydrant. And we had to go to the hospital. And our mom and dad said, you know, when we got home, their big message, they sat us down, and they said, you need to be calmer, you need to be more loving toward each other, and you need to wear helmets. Well, we didn't wear helmets, but anyhow, throughout our lives, the temptation was to get even, and our scripture today talks about how um, the Israelites were actually allowed to get even for when someone did something wrong to them. You'll hear about it in a minute. How, well, you won't hear about it because you'll be gone. They'll hear about it in a minute. Uh, how... If someone did something to you, you could do the same thing back to them. And guess who said that was not right? Jesus. He said, no way. When someone does something to you, you should be nice to them. You should even offer to let them do more to you. You should remain patient and calm. And when someone asks for your jacket, you should give them your cloak too, your your, your robe too, and give them everything that they need. So maybe we're a little young. But I promise the temptation to get even may happen. But that's not what God tells us to do. God tells us to love one another and to be sacrificial in our love, willing to uh, you know, give others what they need. And that's how Jesus calls us to live. All right. I see Julia is back there waiting for you. So let's have a prayer. And you can repeat after me. And then Grammy, Sammy, and Julie will t- Julia will take you to children's church. Dear God, help us to love others. Help us to resist getting even. Help us to be the people you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, y'all, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. I had a uh, funeral yesterday, and it was late in the afternoon, and it has thrown me out of my normal weekend routine. So we'll see how this goes. The only thing I can tell you is this is Chris started right on time, started a a few minutes early, so we were ready to go right at nine. Uh, This might be a shorter sermon, so we won't even be late for Sunday school today, I promise you. Um, I do have three things that I want to highlight for you before we get to prayer time or before we even get into the sermon. Uh, The first one is, you may have noticed the table is out there for Celebrate to sign up. A lot of people signed up last week, and that was a great, great, great thing. But there are a lot of vacancies still on that list. This is a wonderful event, and um, we've opened it up to maybe even a few more schools and groups this year. So it could be really, really big, and we need you. Um, The date is October 5. Yes, 5. Yes, October 5th. And... I know that there are football games that day. I know that there are other things that day. But if there is any way you could find a couple hours in your day to come and brighten the lives of children in our community, it's going to be a rewarding and wonderful day. Um, And I will see you there. So please consider signing up for that. Other things that are more for you than for the community um, that you might consider Wednesday, this Wednesday is our first Life Center study for the fall season, 
and it's a, a, a topic, the topic, the four, to, the four session topic, it's not four weeks in a row, is uh, love your neighbor. And Wednesday night, we'll have uh, a meal and table discussion, and I'll teach a lesson. And there is a blue flyer <clears throat> floating around the church that, that advertises it. And then there is a kind of a creamy pink kind of flyer that has the dates on it, so you can, can write those down. And what do they do about RSVPing for that? How does that work? Let the church know, okay. But if you haven't done that, don't, it's not too late. And if you forget to do that, come on, we'll figure it out. Um, and that starts this Wednesday, and we hope to see you there. It's going to be a really good study, and um, I think you'll find it very rewarding. And then the last one in the not-too-distant future... Uh, if you have signed up for book study, uh, that starts. So if you haven't gotten your book yet, or if you, if you haven't started your book yet like me, um, it's time to get going on that. And it's also important that you let Jen know in the office what's going on with, if you're attending the, the daytime session or the nighttime session, there is a circle meeting at the same time as the nighttime session. So if we will not be in 222. The circle owns 222, so we will be in the parlor for the nighttime session. There are only two or three people signed up for the nighttime one, so. Um, but it is Thursday, not, Thursday morning, Thursday, Thursday night. Uh, because of the Life Center study, it's just the reality that we have to be double booked. I mean, it's just how it has to happen. Anyway, so if you are attending those, the nighttime session, uh, please, you need to let somebody know. A lot of times we have six or eight sign up for the daytime and four or five sign up for the nighttime, and then we have 12 and 15, you know, so we need to know so that I can make sure that uh, <clears throat> all works out. So store all those things in your memory banks, um, and let's go ahead and continue on with our journey with our verses that sometimes get misunderstood or misused. Today... We are uh, looking at an often quoted Old Testament verse. In fact, it's one that even Jesus himself quotes um, in Matthew, and we'll get to that in a moment. You kind of have, you may have noticed there's a little bonus text in our, the bulletin today. And looking at just this Old Testament verse and looking at it from an Old Testament perspective, we may not be wrong in the way we translate it. But when we take the information and interpretation of Jesus, that we under, it's that we understand that we can't, under, we can't follow the Old Testament to the letter of the law. That Jesus came to replace that law, and we can't live in that Old Testament law. Now, criminals in movies and television have used the Old Testament understanding of this passage to justify retaliation for years. In fact, I'll bet if you sat and thought about it, you could think easily of a crime TV show or a mobster movie or something. I think there might even be a movie entitled Eye for an Eye, um, you know, where someone's family was wronged and they go seeking justice. I think that's the basis of every Steven Seagal movie ever made. Um, uh, or or some, of the, uh, some of those Taken movies. Or uh, didn't John Wick go after someone because they killed his dog? Right, so eye for an eye is a theme in movies and TV out there, right? Um, but it's the get even or the to make it right through inflicting more damage. Is that really at the heart of the Christian faith? I think obviously we would say the answer to that is no. So let's listen to the original text in Exodus, and then we're going to talk about that for just a minute, and then we're going to jump over to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 and see what Jesus has to say about this whole eye for an eye concept. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you this day for the chance to be in this your word, and we thank you for the gift of your Son who clarified uh, the law for us in the new covenant with you. And we pray, Lord God, that you would uh, let us just hear the message you have for us this day. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is Exodus 21, verses 12 through 27. And this is, it's, it's, just so you know, this is a series of laws, all right? So we're reading the rule book for the, for the Israelites. 
Anyone who strikes a person with a fatal blow is to be put to death. However, however, if it's not done intentionally, but God lets it happen, they are free to place to a place I will designate. To flee to a place I will designate. But if anyone schemes and kills someone deliberately, that person is to be taken from my altar and put to death. Anyone who attacks their father or mother is to be put to death. Anyone who kidnaps someone is to be put to death. Pretty tough crowd here, right, from the Old Testament Israelites. Whether the victim has been sold or is still in the kidnapper's possession. Anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. If people quarrel and one person hits another with a stone or with their fist and the victim does not die but is confined to bed, the one who struck... the who struck the blow will not be held liable if the other can get up and walk around outside with a staff. However, the yeah, right. However, the guilty party must pay the injured person for any loss of time and see that the victim is completely healed. So, basically, it was uh, uh, lost wages and, and loss of time. So there was probably some some scale for compensation there. This is pretty rough. I need a little break here. Anyone who beats their male or female slave with a rod must be punished if the slave dies as a direct result. But they are not to be punished if the slave recovers after a day or two, since the slave is their property. If people are fighting and hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely, but there is no serious injury, the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. But if there is... Serious injury, you are to take, a, take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. You didn't realize all those things. You've heard eye for eye, maybe even have heard tooth for tooth, but hand for hand, foot for foot. And we know that in some Middle Eastern cultures, even today, there's penalties, you know, losing a hand for... for uh, theft and things like that in their, written in their old laws. But burn for burn and wound for wound, this is downright terrifying, isn't it? An owner who hits a male or female slave in the eye and destroys it must let the slave go free to compensate for the eye. And the owner who knocks out the tooth of a male or female slave must let the slave go free to compensate for the tooth. All right. So here is this list of laws, and you're probably wondering, why on earth is this in the Bible? I mean, why is this part of God's Scripture? Well, this is in Exodus, as we saw, and this is part of the laws that um, Moses established for the people. Uh, If you think about it, this passage is part of the earliest Hebrew law, and as the community grew and as they left uh, Egypt and they started across the wilderness, they were getting larger, and they were growing and multiplying. And uh, if you read somewhere else in the Torah, it says that the recording is that there were 600,000 men between the ages of 20 and 60. All right? So let's just do some estimation. Let's say that there were maybe that many women as well. So that's 600,000 women, plus children under 20, plus folks that even though it would have been, uh, you know, maybe not as many, plus people over 60. Uh, So we're talking about like a million and a half people, right? That's a lot of people. That is, uh, I think, if you take out the suburb and, you know, talk about just the city of Raleigh or just the city of Charlotte or just the city of Greensboro, that's bigger than any of those without the Jamestowns and the Oak Ridges and the, you know, all those outlying suburban areas, just cities proper. I think that would be representative of the biggest city in North Carolina. So it's natural at this point that there has to be some law and order. And also keep in mind, there are nomadic people traveling through the wilderness and the, the desert, and they've just crossed the Red Sea, and they probably have a couple hundred thousand animals with them, and everything they own. So it's not like I left, we left our house today, probably didn't turn on the security cameras, but they did lock the doors, we put the garage door down, um, and our important documents and valuables are locked in a safe, And there are dogs there, right? That's not how it was for these folks. They were traveling with their family, with their servants or or slaves as they were in that time. Um, 
Uh, they were traveling with all of their worldly possessions and all of their animals, which they depended on for food, for clothing, for, 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 for milk, maybe from goats or something like that, the skins to make clothing and the meat to eat and, and also to make ritual sacrifices to God. Everything they had was on this journey. So it was necessary to establish not only rules, but punishments and reparations that would be made if the laws were broken. Now remember, Moses had courts and had decisions and a number of places that said, we'll send the person away to the place that we decide. So there was court stuff going on, but they did not have any, there's no fee unless we get money for you, lawyers doing, you know, uh, these things. There There was just this set of rules that governed this, even down to servants. And these rules showed the importance and value of human life and of order to the society. In modern times, what has happened is we just take the catchphrase from this scripture, and we use it absolutely backwards. And practically, as I said, every mob movie or uh, gang or crime television show, someone says, an eye for an eye either uh, to justify an action or to green light the act of revenge. The other one we hear semi-associated with these movies is, am I my brother's keeper, right? Talking about Cain and Abel. And they use it exactly opposite most of the times where in the movies they say, yes, I'm your brother's, I'm your brother and I'm your keeper, when really um, Cain killed Abel. Cain was saying to God, I don't know where he is. I'm not responsible for him, you know, kind of trying to, to get off the hook. So most often... When people say this, it's to give biblical justification for wishing, or in worst cases, uh, in worst cases, acting in a harmful way towards someone else. And we have broadened this misuse to include financial damages, property damages, or any sort of situation where we feel that we deserve justice. The once rational law that was meant to keep the peace has become for us a license to, at the very least, wish ill on another, and at the very worst, make sure that they get theirs. But Jesus thinks about it another way. In Matthew chapter 5, near the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is going to tell the people that these laws are not the way of the Lord in him. He has a large captive audience, and, for, and, and, the first, and, and at the very first, he tells them that there's a better way than the law you know. So let's listen to that here in Matthew chapter 5, just verses 38 through 41. You have heard it was said that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So already Jesus is directly quoting this Exodus passage that we just read, and the people would know this, and the people, you know... Uh, hundreds if not thousands of years later have, have, have this has been their the model for their society maybe some of them have even used this law to get what is rightfully theirs or to man, or to demand justice but i tell you do not resist an evil person if anyone slaps you on the right cheek turn to them the other cheek also and if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Now, having read this much better passage, I will finally say this is the word of the Lord, and you can say, thanks be to God. Now, wait a minute. Did Jesus just tell us to offer the other cheek? Someone has hit me, and I'm to let them do it again. But in Exodus, I heard that it was fair game. I could demand my, my, my equal due. A person has wronged me, so I deserve what is rightly mine. I like the sound of that a lot better than what Jesus has to say. Jesus is telling us to take it. More than, the, more than they ask for, he's, he's saying, to give I'm not sure I like the sound of that. In this statement, Jesus takes the legalism out of the law, and he makes it personal. He infuses the law with the love 
and grace and compassion of God that is manifest in Him, that is standing right there in front of them in Him. Think, think about this for a second. The very thing He is speaking about and that He is modeling and living right there in front of them and that He will carry all the way to the cross. He'll model this all the way through His time before uh, the Sanhedrin, His time before Pilate, the abuse that He will take silently on his difficult journey to the cross for you and for me. Now, I am not great at love and grace and compassion. I don't jump all the way to an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth, but I'll sure grumble about someone that has done me wrong, right? I'll sure complain about it. I'll sure complain about doing the right thing for them, even when I know it's probably the right thing. Um, But I think that if we can move... In that direction, if we can move away from wishing someone their just due or that we can move away from the get-even attitudes, that we can begin to model more of what Jesus is talking about here in this passage. As Christians, we should not feel, maybe we, 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 we will naturally feel it as fallen and broken people, but we should push away and pray away and move away from the desire to get even. This is the message of Jesus. Last week we saw how the exiled Israelites were told to pray for their Babylonian captors. And now Jesus is blowing up the law and says that we should not seek revenge or justice in Him. As Christians, we aren't to to be a people of revenge. And, you know, I thought about what example I would insert here that would not incriminate me too badly. And that's why I chose to tell the kids about my brother and I playing hockey. We were probably 20 and 18, and we were playing street hockey with a bunch of kids, and I just checked him, and he stumbled, and his stick caught my feet, and we both ate that fire hydrant, and we went to to the hospital. But here's the rest of the story. I had joined a fraternity, and I had decided with a bunch of knuckleheads to go and get a fraternity crest tattooed on my leg. And my little brother, who I had just shoved into a fire hydrant, sat with me in the hot... Joanne, would you come here? Oh, you have a skirt on. Never mind. Uh, Avis, would you come here? Oh, it's a skort? (laughs) No, come on, Avis. You're faster. (laughs) Sit right here, my dear. My brother sat... Now, don't move. I'm going to move closer to you. My brother sat like this the entire time with his leg on my leg Hiding that tattoo from my mother. Okay, honey, you can go back to your seat. The very kid who I had just concussed and shoved to the ground in anger cared so much about me and hiding that tattoo that he used his body to shield me from my dad. And the rest of the story in the living room when we got home, we came home. And my parents said, boys, we need to talk. And we sat down, and my brother was cool as a cucumber. And I was sweating and full of fear. And my dad said, we, think we need to talk to you about something. And I broke. And I said, Dad, I'm sorry. It was peer pressure. I'll never get another one. <laughs> yeah, 30 years later, that's not really valid, is it, right? But anyhow, and he said, Huh, we were just going to tell you to wear helmets. That day burns in me 30 years later. In fact, I will see, I'm going to Pittsburgh Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I'll be home just in time for Life Center study. It's going to be awesome. Be there. Um, And I'm going to sleep at my brother's house tonight. I will probably apologize to him about that today again, 30 years later. 
nothing good comes from getting even. Our life of faith, even, even if we're rewarded the greatest reparations, it's a tarnished feeling of evenness or fairness because it's one centered in sin. It's one centered in brokenness. Um, and it's something we should avoid as Christians. Our very relationship with God is based on forgiveness and grace. And these are the things we should model. To the best of our availability, we are to model these things. Next week, we will look at the most famous verse in all of Scripture. As we finally leave the Old Testament, we'll now have three weeks of New Testament verses uh, to look at. And then we're going to dive right into that generosity program that, that Chris and I are working on. And then we're going to dive right into uh, Advent. So come back next week and we'll find about, out about what was really meant by God loving the world. Let's pray together. Lord God, help us to resist and help us to give to you our feelings and desires for uh, an eye for an eye. Help us to understand that in Jesus, that law was replaced with your law of love and grace and caring and compassion. Your law of humility. And Lord, help us to live as humble people, doing your work and doing your will. And help us to, to understand that, that you are just and right and fair. And you will handle everyone accordingly. And it just isn't our job. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. I have some prayer concerns to share with you. Um, first, you have on the list here... Uh, we continue to pray for Gail Brooks and her brothers in the passing of Joe Burroughs. Her service is next Saturday at 11. And we hope to see you all there in the sanctuary. Uh, Stephen Stiles, uh, we haven't seen him in a little while. And uh, Amy told me and then Stephen contacted me and we talked. Stephen had a heart attack uh, Thursday a week ago. And he has gotten some stints. And is he, is he back to, Amy, is he back to work? Okay, so for Stephen, we ask for prayers. Uh, David Bean is, you know, recovering from his back issues. The Adams family, I'll wait. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, Andy's dad passed away, and his service was yesterday in Burlington. So um, I was unable to be with Andy and, and Monica and their family yesterday, but I did talk to him. Uh, before the service, and he said it has just been a real uh, a week of, of, of welcomes and goodbyes, welcoming their first grandchild and saying goodbye to his dad. So for Andy and Monica and the family, we ask for prayer. Oline Mabe recovering at home. Uh, Cheryl Jennings, I saw Cheryl Thursday, and... Um, She is still at Shannon Gray, and they are struggling to figure out what's next, where she will go for assistance, how she will get in-home health care. Uh, her daughter is trying to do this from Colorado on the phone, so it's, it's difficult. So for Cheryl, who's making nice progress in recovery, we need to pray for the process, for figuring out what the next steps are for her as she will have that neck brace on. Uh, at least another month, I think, maybe even six, eight weeks. And then for John Amaya, we ask for prayers. Uh, uh, John is a, an 11 o'clock person that you may not know. He's from Cameroon. Uh, he is, has been battling cancer uh, for many, many years, and, and it's been back and more serious than in the last year. And he will have a procedure uh, this week. So for John and for the success of that procedure. And then Avis asked for prayers for, is that... Dylan, Oh, it's Declan. Okay. Mulligan. He's one of Avis's friends. And during soccer on Thursday, he suffered a spinal concussion and was in the hospital until last night. 
So we're going to pray for his therapy, his recovery, and rehab uh, for Declan. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this day to come together and to worship you, and we, Lord, give to you those things that are on our hearts, those things that are on our minds, those people that we pray for and worry about each day that maybe we don't write down or maybe we just keep to ourselves. But, Lord, we just pray that you would work in each of those situations. We pray for everyone on our prayer concern list that's been there for some time. And, Lord, we pray for those that we mentioned by name today. We pray for young Declan and this injury. We pray for a full and complete recovery, and we just pray for all that process. We pray, Lord, for Cheryl as she... Lord, looks for the place where she will go for the next steps of her recovery and help her children and help her to make the right decisions. Lord, we pray for Carol Miller, who is in the hospital with bronchitis, and we pray for Stephen Stiles recovering at home from heart attack. Lord, work in each of these folks' lives. We pray for the Adams family and for the Klein family. Um, recovering from the loss of loved ones. And Lord, we just pray that those families could feel the peace and comfort of your spirit. Lord, we pray for everyone else that we, we, we love and care for. We thank you that Al is with us today, and we pray for continued healing for his arm as he's getting closer to his next appointment. We pray for Brenda recovering from hernia surgery and Brenda recovering from hip surgery and Olene recovering at home. And we pray, Lord God, that you would strengthen each of these people each day. Father, we pray for our church. We pray for the things that we set out to do. We pray specifically, Lord, for Celebrate and for the Life Center study, Lord, that we might feed others and we might be fed. And we challenge, uh, we just ask that we could all step up to these challenges uh, to serve others that celebrate and to come and to enjoy a time of fellowship and growth at the Life Center study, Lord. We pray for our session, for our leaders and our decision makers. We pray for the ongoing work of budgeting and trying to find uh, the right places to use your money for your glory. And Lord, we pray for our nation and for our leaders and our decision makers. We pray for, uh, Lord, the, the, the just division and unrest in this country. And we pray that we could be bound together by you. Lord, we ask these things in the name of your Son, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, now it's time to get excited, to be excited for all that is going on in the life of the church, for for the Sunday school class that you're getting ready to make your way to. I know that the, the, the junior high and senior high kids are going to get sugared up on donuts, so be excited. And on this day, let's be thankful for how God has blessed us and continues to bless us. And let's stand and sing our closing song as we receive our morning tithes and offerings. is beaten, you have rescued me, singing out, Jesus is alive. The empty cross, the empty grave, life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive. He's alive, and oh.
forgot next week, next Sunday is Combined Sunday. It's a fifth Sunday. So many things are happening. The first is at 845, there is a College of Elders meeting for all sitting and rotated elders. The second is the combined service at 10 o'clock. Immediately following that service, in the, the 90 seconds it takes to uncover the covered dishes, we will have a congregational meeting to elect the class of 2027. And then there's a wonderful covered dish dinner. So make your best thing. Come and share. We haven't done that in a good while. It is time to come together as a community of faith. We'll worship around tables so we can get right into the eating. And it's going to be a great, 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 great day. If you're an elder, come at 845. If you're not, come at 950 to put down your covered dish and get into your seat before worship. And then we can do it all again. Go with God's blessing. Repay no one evil for evil. Forget about that eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Practice the love and turn the other cheek. Go with God's blessing. Amen. Oh, what a glorious day. What a glorious way.